the real purpose of this is just to kind of acquaint you folks with those of you that are new to us with the Pediatric Ophthalmology Service, Primary Children's Hospital, and uh, that because um, if you've been on call, you realize you get called over there, you have to do things, and um, it's easier if you have an idea what's going on. Fortunately, your senior or senior residents, uh, those who've been on the ser our service in particular, know where everything is and how things work and can help you through things, and I would use them as a, a resource. Um, in terms of our pediatric ophthalmology service, the pediatric ophthalmology service and division of the Department of Ophthalmology and Moran Eye Center is located at Primary Children's Hospital. Our administrative offices are on the fifth floor where everybody else's are here, but our clinic is on the fourth floor of primary, just when you go over the bridge, right side, and if you need to get in there to do something with a patient, um, if you don't have badge access, which you should have to be able to get into the children's hospital to be able to do consults, your badge should access our clinic. If it doesn't, talk to security. If they tell you no, uh, come by clinic and we'll work it out. Because if you need to get in there to drag a patient in there, to get an indirect, to do whatever, uh, you know, fine. If you take lid speculum sets from our clinic, they need to come back to our clinic, please. Don't leave them at the Moran OR, in the resident room. Keep them in your bag forever. Uh, we will continue to have them as long as they get brought back. Um, in terms of, you know, our locations, we do have satellite clinics that you need to be aware of. Two right now, one at Riverton, which is with a primary children's hospital outpatient, outpatient clinic, outpatient surgery setup. It's not a hospital, it's an outpatient clinic. Um, and Farmington, similarly, we have, that's a university, not an Intermountain facility. Farmington is a, a facility north. Uh, the people primarily involved, Dr. Dries, Dr. Jardine, go to Farmington. Dr. Uh, um, Young, Owen, and Jardine go to Riverton. And so we have those clinics staffed most days. That may be of use to you when you're trying to arrange follow-up for some patient that you've seen as an inpatient here or through the ER. And it turns out they live you know, 100 yards from the Farmington Clinic, instead of making them go to Riverton to see someone, it may be wise to have them seen at Farmington. And, you know, those things, though, can usually be worked out the next morning by our staff. If you pass the matches along, just, you know, help them find the closest place to be seen for follow-up. Um, and you are not responsible under any circumstance to run to Farmington or to Riverton to see Patients, just be aware of me, like after hours or something, patients come here to see you. Occasionally, residents have gone down that slippery slope where somebody's wanted them to go to St. Mark's or IMC or Jordan Valley Hospital. Realize that I don't think our malpractice coverage covers you if you do that. You're not responsible for it. Many of the hospitals in the area, if you haven't caught on to it already, choose to provide a lot of their, in fact, ophthalmology coverage by sending patients to us. Even if they have an ophthalmology call schedule, they call that ophthalmologist, they say, I'm busy, um, uh, does the patient have insurance? And they say no, and they say fine, send the patient to the university. Um, and does that happen? Yes, it does, unfortunately. You know, the way I look at that is that we generate interesting patients, surgical cases, and various other things by patients that people send to us, and the hope is they send patients to us that do help uh, pay for us all to be here, and we take care of the rest of them because taking care of people is what we do. Um, now, as far as our service you know, coverage, there are, at the moment, um, five pediatric ophthalmologists. You may or may not have worked or encountered all of us, myself, uh, Dave Dries, um, and then uh, Mary L. Young, Leah Owen, and, and Griffin Jardine. Uh, Dr. Owen has protected research time, so if you're trying to get a hold of her and they say she's in the lab, she is our first kind of half-time PhD basic science research person in pediatric ophthalmology. Julie Harmon is our orthoptist, super duper technician with extra schooling, training, and expertise in dealing with ocular motility issues. She is somebody you should latch on to 
securely when you are on our service or you have a chance to come to clinic, uh, primarily because that is where you will gain a lot of your knowledge about assessing ocular motility and about strabismus. That's what she does. She's a wonderful teacher. She's enthusiastic, and it should work well. Uh, you know, to do that when you're on the service, uh, part of the what, what you're doing is good morning. Um, uh, to spend time with Julie and to see patients with her. Now, retinopathy prematurity exams. Um, you will, by the time you leave here at the end of your residency, have uh, uh, more than adequate exposure to be able to allow you to go into the NICU and try to assess an infant for retinopathy prematurity. Will you acquire the expertise to be able to go in and say definitively, the patient's still in zone two, they're in zone three, gee, this is a, you know aggressive posterior ROP? Probably not for most of you. But my goal, I want you to be able to safely examine infants in the NICU. I want you to know about ROP. If you go do comprehensive ophthalmology out in Vernal, and we send a patient back to your area and ask them to see, you to see them in follow-up, I want you to know how to safely take a look at them and do that. Um, you will, when you're on our service, every single week have the opportunity to go with one of us on rounds in the NICU to see babies. It happens every week every week of the year, and you will get called when you're on call asking questions about, gee, baby so-and-so had this or that you know, type ROP, can they go to the OR to have their uh, 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 you know, takedown procedure, or um, we want to put them on Sudenafil uh, for their heart failure, is that okay with their ROP? Please do not take it upon yourself to make that decision. Those decisions carry with it potential for everlasting blindness and some of the largest lawsuits in ophthalmology today are related to retinopathy prematurity, mainly looking at the life expectancy change in productivity cost for care of a blind infant. Um, those are big decisions and those from my perspective always get deferred to faculty. So your job with that is to make sure we get the message and we give them an answer and please do that and it's perfectly okay to call me. My phone numbers are on this thing and this is in the you know the list of lectures, this document, and we'll update it uh, with Elaine. Um, but if there's a question, if my cell phone rings and I answer it, you've got me and I carry it with me most of the time and it's always okay to call. Um, we also have the luxury now of having photos taken um, on ROP rounds. And we take photos on every baby, and we make every effort when you're on the service to review those photos together. Um, photo, photos are used now mainly for documentation here, and also um, yesterday. Um, I saw a, a couple of babies um, in primary that I wanted to get Dr. Hartnett's thoughts on, kids that she had treated, and she and Nico reviewed the photos by mid-afternoon and were able to get back to me. Uh, so within 24 hours, that had all been accomplished without them having to go to the bedside and see the baby. So the photos are, are pretty cool. Uh, uh, Melissa Chandler, one of our photographers, is now our you know, photographer of choice in the NICU. If you have a chance to tag along with her, you can look as she's taking the photos to see what we're seeing in the back of these kids' eyes. Uh, as far as consults go, we have things, as you're aware, divided now with this first year consult service. Uh, uh, Marshall's currently the um, uh, center of uh, that uh, universe. And we've made an effort due to some recent changes that Sophia Fang, our finishing fellow, came up with to try to make certain that consults are getting to the consult resident, but other questions that are best directed to the resident on the PEED service get to them. I need feedback from you all ongoing over the next month or two as to how that is working. So far, my sense in talking to the people to whom that's been disseminated, that would mainly be the NICU, PACU. PACU's oblivious. They're always oblivious. They don't know. Um, and uh, they just call somebody, somebody answers, and they'll probably continue to do that. The folks in the NICU were grateful, and they've already found it useful um, using 
Brad to get messages to me about things real time. And hopefully, what we're trying to avoid is having one of you called when you're not in the OR with us, while we're still sitting in the OR, about clarifying orders on a patient we just operated on that you know nothing about, nobody's checked the patient out to you. That's a total waste of your time, total waste of effort. And, and that was the, the major focus of this. Similar to a trip I made down to the ER, oh, now it was probably just six or seven years ago, I'm looking at their call, their, their schedule of ophthalmologists that they sent patients to for follow-up from the ER. Back, it was back from in the days when every general ophthalmologist in town was on the staff. They all provided coverage. It turned out when I looked at that list, there were at least six or seven ophthalmologists on that list who were dead that they were sending patients to. Some of them had died 15 or 20 years ago. Um, and so I, I had to kind of sit down with the director of the ER, my buddy Jeff Shunk, and, and, and say, Jeff, if you guys would stop referring patients to dead ophthalmologists, <laughs> it would probably be a good thing for patient care. Sometimes looking at things critically is helpful. Now, as far as consults go, when you have consults, please, if there is any question about what's going on with the patient, run it by the resident on our service. They've had a bit more experience with this. They're thinking, living, and breathing pediatric ophthalmology at the moment. They can look. They may provide an extra set of eyes. If we have a fellow and we don't this year, the fellow is you know, often the faculty supervising consults. But whoever is in clinic here at primary is also your asset. Stop by clinic. Grab me. Grab whoever's there in between patients. We'll talk about it. If you think a kid needs to be sedated, please think about who else might want to be there. If there's some really important question they're trying to answer and you've never seen it before, you may want to have, if you're on call, you're getting the consult, the senior resident or one of the faculty involved so that everybody that needs to see the kid can get a look. The other thing to think about is does the patient really need to be sedated? Could the more senior resident, could the faculty get a look without sedation at all? And it, it may be worth a conversation with a more senior resident if you're the consult person trying to sort that out. I mentioned the outside clinics at, oh, as far as vacations and meetings, I mean, you do what you need to do on our service. Um, you know, send those things and MedHub, things have changed from the old uh, sheets that we used to sign. But basically, if somebody <coughs> hurts me, I go on MedHub. Um, if I can access it on a good day, I can most of the time, and sign off on it for you. You know, you just think about what you're missing, you know, as you go, but vacations are important, meetings are important, and I think if you get a chance to go present something in a meeting, that's a wonderful opportunity, you should do it. What about this uh, American Fork Training School Clinic? Um, has anybody here, Mike, you've been there. You've been anybody there. else been there? It is basically a um, residential Center for Unplaceable Developmentally Impaired Adults. When I came here to the department, I was misled purposefully uh, by our chairman and Alan Crandall, who used the word school liberally, thinking that somehow children were involved to get me to go out there and, and take responsibility for providing eye care there. And, you know, yes, pediatric ophthalmology does have, we, we have special skills in examining kids that don't want to be examined and trying to examine patients without being bit, hit, or slipping in a puddle of urine. Um, those are useful skills to apply as a resident uh, to, to acquire. And there actually are interesting patients who need care. There is a lot of either self-abusive trauma, trauma, things related to diseases that these folks have that result in cataracts, retinal detachments, glaucoma, and Significant refractive error, the staff there will help sedate patients for you and get a look. And from my perspective, if you get a patient who needs uh, you know, a surgical procedure, if it's something you're capable of doing, you find an appropriate faculty member, you get it taken care of, and, and you do it. Um, you know, from my involvement in this is just from years ago, I was kind of to being the faculty member responsible for it. I can't even, in all honesty, tell you where the training school is other than it's an American fork because it's been at least 25 years since I've gone through the front door of the place. Um, if you're having problems out there, let me know. 
And if you're not getting the pass-through reimbursement that goes through Elaine and allows you to get things at the bookstore, let me know. Um, that was worked out. I worked that out when the university basically wanted to put that in the bank and have you do the work for free. Uh, when GME found out that I was just passing the money on to the residents, um, I got in some trouble for that. So we can't continue that. But the other should work. And if, you know, usually the residents go when you're on our service. So you find a day when you're not in clinic, not in the OR, and try to arrange it that way so you're not missing something else. But if it isn't working out again, I need to know. Come on here, computer. There we go. So, again, things that are commonly borrowed from our clinic include, if you don't have it with you, tonneau pens, lid speculums, drops. Um, you know, if you don't know where those things are, find the resident on our service when they're in clinic, and they can show you where everything is. And you're welcome to come see patients there. If you see patients there, please put covers back on. Excuse me, tidy things up. And... Um, be aware that there are things out front, you know, like at our front desk, that we don't want families and patients rummaging through necessarily while they're waiting for somebody to be seen. Um, so, uh, you know, do your best with that. Now, a couple of specific, you know, things related to consults. If there's a post-op patient with a problem, whichever one of us did the surgery would love to hear about it. If there's an issue, we may be able to save you a lot of looking, talking, and doing just talking over the phone for five minutes because we may have talked to the patient half an hour ago or the, the, the parent we may know what's going on may already have concerns we may want to see the patient I think that's something that it's always okay to call any of us you know if we operated on the patient recently and there's some sort of trouble um, regarding political issues there are some service overlap areas where there's a little bit of competition for patients at time that would include patients with orbital facial fractures, facial injuries, and the question is whether plastic surgery, craniofacial surgery, oculoplastics, neurosurgery is going to fix things. And for a lot of those things, any of those folks can fix a lot of the stuff. And so there isn't anything, you know, if ENT calls us, they're going to be taking a patient to the OR to fix fractures and do something, and they want us to look at the eyes. We need to look at the eyes. It's the best thing for the patient. Um, and so I think that it is not the case that we want to go in and say, well, this has to be fixed by our oculoplastics folks. It's always okay to offer them, say, would you like us to have oculoplastics involved? And then if there is some issue that, you know, sounds like somebody's unhappy or grumpy about something that's occurred with that, call me. I need to know about it. I need to try to smooth it over. Being able to see a lot of these patients involves, you know, providing consistent good service and good communication so that everybody knows what's going on. Um, that's particularly the case with some of the services where we have folks with larger egos. Um, that would include mainly plastic surgery and craniofacial, where people tend to get their knickers in a twist and get all wound up about things, and I don't want them yelling at you. I don't care if they yell at me. Um, what about abusive head trauma? We're going to talk about that a little bit if we have time. Non-accidental trauma, um, you know, if you aren't aware, those of you who are starting, there are things that we see in kids who have been abused, particularly shaken, that can be very suggestive, helpful in a courtroom, help sort things out, and you will be asked on a very regular basis at primary to see kids with, you know, the question is, is this child abuse? basically, and you're looking for retinal hemorrhages, and it turns out that although when I first started doing this, we thought that every kid with retinal hemorrhages had been shaken, that isn't the case. You know, there are certain patterns of those things that we're going to look at in a bit that are suggestive of that, so that what I would do, you know, with this is first of all, get good information, do the best exam that you can, record what you see, and if you think that uh, there, I mean, if there are retinal hemorrhages, every single one of those kids needs to be examined at some point by a faculty member. Whether that be fellow, one of the Div Peds division members, retina fellow, retina attending, 
And basically, the way we want to use that chain of command, and what I worked at to keep the Retina Fellows involved in this, is that we go for the Peds Fellow, if there is one, Peds Attendings first. So you exhaust the Peds Attendings. Then after that, you call the Retina Fellow. I mean, if all of us are out of town at the same meeting, that's when the Retina Fellow gets called. And lastly, the Retina Attending. And there is pretty good evidence that those kids need to be seen by somebody who's had a lot of experience with this and can make a somewhat authoritative assessment of things within 24 hours. So that that is something that will involve somebody seeing them over the weekend. Now at the same time, we take pictures of all of these kids with the RETCAM. If you haven't used the RETCAM, don't let this at bedside be your first attempt to turn it on and do something with it. Get someone who has used it. It is very expensive. Each of those little lenses that go on there, if they slip, drop, or not correctly attached to the camera, are at least $10,000 a piece. And I have had residents in the past drop them. They don't do well after they're dropped. They don't bounce well. Um, there's a book in the library on abusive head trauma. It was um, edited by Lori Frazier, Rob Parrish, two colleagues of mine. I took all the pictures and wrote everything that has to do with eyes in that book. Um, and it's there. There's also a copy on my bookshelf upstairs, which you're welcome to go sit in my office and look at things. And there's a copy in our clinic and primary. Um, in addition to the photos, we get OCT if there are findings of these circumacular folds or retinoschisis in the posterior pole to document the anatomy. And one of the questions might be, why do we document this and why is it such a big issue? Well, it turns out that we get called to go to court regularly on these things. I could not count the number of times I've been in court testifying in these things. And it really helps to have good information. And the last thing you want to do when you're off doing a fellowship somewhere or you're starting a practice is to get subpoenaed and have to come back here and testify and have some defense attorney looking at you saying, well, doctor, at the time you did this, how many of these had you seen? Tell me all about all your expertise in this area. And they're going to make you look like an absolute fool. And not that you don't know 10 times or more about it than they do. They're still going to do that. That's their job. And you want to drop that on one of us, not on yourself. Because if I've seen the patient, they're going to call me to go to court, not you. Um, realize that the attendings in what they call safe and healthy families, those are the child abuse specialist pediatricians at primary, all have access to access our image system, so that once those photos are in there and Mel or Glenn or Danielle uploads them, they can look at them themselves. My phone numbers are on here. That pager doesn't exist anymore. That needs to be deleted. Um, I turned it in. Um, but I think calls that go to that number still just go to my cell phone. Um, that home phone number also doesn't exist. The cell number is now my only uh, a phone line, and um, it is the same. Now, what are we going to do when you guys get to clinic? And in clinic, basically, you're going to learn how to examine kids, take a history, and the pertinent things, in addition to just examining kids of all ages, is to learn how to do a competent motility exam, plan surgery, You'll learn how to do surgery uh, as far as muscle surgery. You're also going to gain some expertise in how to do uh, an anterior segment exam as needed with appropriate you know, equipment, how to do a, a, a fundus exam as needed with appropriate equipment, when it's time to bail and go to the operating room to do an exam or anesthesia. Um, it turns out in your second year, your retina rotation, your PEDS rotation are kind of the key things in terms of this clinical competency committee where we get together and figure out how well you're all doing. And so I'm, you know, kind of your representative for that, to go to bat for you to make sure that things are being evaluated well. If there are concerns with any of that, I'm happy to talk to you about it. The other thing I want you to do when you're on the service is to gain a firm understanding about how we relate to pediatric services, the folks who provide vision support services. Um, those are really kind of important contacts and interactions. Um, all of you, when you start second year on our service, you have <coughs> um, And we provide headlights 
and uh, take advantage of every opportunity you have to do practice surgery uh, with a senior resident or faculty member, and we'll try to arrange those. Uh, I've had Dr. Jardine doing most of that recently. As far as doing scleral passes, he's kind of combined that with residents and with the uh, medical students that we're looking at taking as residents. Um, at Moran, we do adult eye muscle surgery. That's what goes on there mainly. Um, we have most days one or more people operating at primary, so it's a lot of surgery that goes on. You'll have an opportunity to participate in all of that. Right now, we're not doing any eye muscle surgery at the VA. All those VA patients come to see us here now, and so they're being done at Moran, which is probably a better use of your time. So you're seeing those second year. Third year, found that most of the residents that are at the VA are focusing on doing anterior segment surgery, and many were not particularly interested in doing a lot of eye muscle surgery. If that changes for some reason, we can always send somebody back to the VA, but we're not at the moment. Um, as far as what to read, you know, I'll tell you guys this, I've, you know, when people come on the service to talk about it, from my perspective, every single day, every day of the week, that includes weekends, holidays, and whatever, you should be reading an hour a day in ophthalmology, an hour a day in whatever subspecialty you're doing, and, and read about interesting patients. And so you need to find and carve time in your schedule to set time aside to read, and if you're not doing that, you're behind. And you're not doing justice to your education, which is the reason you're here. You know, we don't need you as a workforce. Um, we're here to train you in, in ophthalmology so that if you're, you know, when we look at, like, preparing for OCAPs, no amount of looking through the home study course two weeks before the test is going to make up for what you didn't read during the year. So keep in mind, you know, why you're here and what you're doing, and if things aren't working and you're not getting a chance to, to read, you need to talk to somebody about it, please. I'm happy to talk to you about it because we need to try to, you know, make time. You're here to learn, and it's our job to make sure that that happens. As far as journals that may have to do just with peds that you may not may or may not be aware of, the Journal of APOS is kind of the primary pediatric ophthalmology journal. Binocular Vision Quarterly is a journal that looks at heavy-duty motility things. It's edited by a guy named Paul Romano, who was a pediatric ophthalmologist who became an editor and publisher. Um, it's worth looking at, but I wouldn't look at it regularly. The APOS journal is certainly look, worth looking through you know, the contents and the abstracts. And the American Orthoptic Journal, Julie's Society's journal, is excellent, wordy. You're not going to get through the whole thing. I think it's useful to use as a resource. And there are books on my bookshelf, books in clinic, and in the library that you can use as a resource. But the main thing you should strive to do and probably go through first year and then review when you're on the service is go through that whole pediatric ophthalmology basic science book. That should be your primary resource. I hate, absolutely hate, trying to tailor what we're doing to get people to do well on tests. But to some extent, we are doing that. I'd much prefer that we just tailor it to what we think you need to know. Turns out that those two things are probably very closely related. And the reality is that you do have to do well on those tests. That's how you're going to pass your boards and be able to practice ophthalmology. So we have to look at that as a reality as well. And uh, if you do feel a need to take something from my bookshelf, please let my secretary know. Uh, days are long past when I can keep track of who's taken what. And I've had many very expensive books disappear over the years. Some of them have been read in people's bathtubs and come back looking much thicker uh, uh, because they've been underwater. Um, uh, try to avoid that if you can. Um, you all, are everybody up to date and up to speed on iCentra? As part of orientation, did they do anything with iCentra this year? Was there any kind of introduction to it? I think so. For us, since we not got for the last for year. the beginning residents. We got for the interns. The interns. Yeah. Okay. PGY twos have already had it, right? Yeah. If you've had it once, that's what you're going to get. But I want to make sure if somebody you're aware of, one of your colleagues who hasn't gotten it at all, it's going to be a real shock because it is the worst electronic medical record system on the planet. Um, uh, you know, they, you know, Intermont basically took a system that the university threw out. The company was going to go into bankruptcy, and they decided to make a deal with them to try to build an EMR, and they basically got what they paid for. 
Um, and if you don't have access to primary, let me know, or computer access, because it's, it's really, really important. Let's get rid of this thing, and let's see if I can then, here, I guess I have to make this smaller, don't I? Here we go. Uh, to clarify one thing you said early on, when we see and uh, call pediatric patients with orbit fractures, yeah. um, I think you said they could follow up with peds or oculoplastics. Who right. Should we send them to? Well, no, I think, I think that I'd send them first to, to if, if it's something that ur you think urgently needs surgery, is definitely going to need surgery, they should follow up with plastics. Otherwise, should, they should follow up with pediatric ophthalmology. Because okay. we're going to get a hold of the oculoplastics folks if they need surgery. And, and we're also going to be the ones who make sure that they are seeing that their alignment's good and all of those things. So if there's any question, have a follow-up with us. On the other hand, if you've, you know, you've got a patient who's Every time they try to look up, their heart rate goes through the floor and they've got what looks like muscle hanging down their maxillary sinus. That's a patient who needs uh, uh, to see the oculoplastics folks now. And now let me see here what we've got. And do, 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 do. This should. All right, so now. So, let's go through this and this. Let's see, does this work? Yeah, it does. How about that? So, the connection between vitreous hemorrhage and intracranial bleeding, not directly related to child abuse, was described first by Tursan. You, you'll read, when you read about hemorrhages, Tursan syndrome, where usually you've got subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, you know, the kind that's associated with the worst headache of your life, and vitreous hemorrhage, and that was described in 1900. There's a pediatrician named Caffey who in 19, mid-1940s made the connection between subdural hematomas, long bone fractures, metaphyseal fractures, and child abuse. And in 74, the term shaken baby syndrome was coined, and um, there are an estimated 2 million kids that get abused in one way, shape, or form in the U.S. each year. A small percentage of those, the presenting findings are ocular. Kids are very, very rare that we see in clinic that come in where we look and we say, gosh, I think this kid's been shaken. Where we usually meet these kids, they're in the PICU. And often in the PICU, after the neurosurgeons have been draining a subdural or doing something else to save their lives, so that of all abused kids, somewhere up to 60% have some sort of ocular findings. Usually those are kids, again, that are shaken. Um, and retinal hemorrhages, they're, as far as specifically, about a quarter of the kids in, in, in some studies have uh, uh, retinal hemorrhages. Um, as far as kids that are shaken, somewhere between 50 and 80%. So there are kids where we've had documented, somebody admitted they were shaken, where they don't have retinal hemorrhages. That can be for a variety of reasons. Often, realize retinal hemorrhages go away, and they can change fairly quickly, so they may well have been shaken. But when you look at that child two or three months down the road, which may be where some of those reports come from, you're not going to see any hemorrhages. They've gone away. Not that the retina hasn't been damaged, or visual pathways in the brain haven't been damaged, but the hemorrhages have gone away. Now, when you're called to see these kids, you'll basically you know, it says a NAT rule out. You want to get an idea of what's gone on, what the story is that they've been told, what the circumstance is. Um, you know, a sort of quintessential, it happens again and again, is that the baby was in the, the care of the mom's boyfriend. Um, and she came home um, and found the child unresponsive and not breathing. Or if the person who did it has any sort of sense around them, and they're not all messed up on some sort of substance uh, that they've been uh, interacting with. Um, they have some sense of guilt when they realize that the kid's doing bad things and they call 911 and get help. But that kind of scenario is very, very common. The other one that is very common is the, well, the baby just rolled off the couch onto a very carpeted floor, and we wound up 
with a combination of skull fractures, intracranial bleeding, and retinal hemorrhages in a child who showed up in the hospital, you know, having respiratory difficulties and seizing. And, you know, when things don't fit, I mean, that is sort of a red flag. Um, when you see these kids, please get that history. And I would, I think, in my own thinking, I want to know about what the intracranial injuries are, what's been done about them, what they've seen on imaging tests. Don't forget to ask about their past ocular history. You know, there are things like, I had bad retinopathy prematurity. I was born very prematurely that make retinal blood vessels more fragile, that may make kids have bleeding that isn't because they were abused. We need to identify those things. There are other, you know, systemic disorders. Um, uh, gl glutaric acidemia type 2, osteogenesis imperfecta, things where, where retinal hemorrhages have been reported, um, kids who are anticoagulated because they've got some cardiovascular issue. Uh, those kids are more prone to retinal hemorrhages with fairly minimal trauma. So, you know, part of our job is to do the best for the patient and have an open mind about what we're looking at. Um, realize you are, when you see that kid becoming part of a multidisciplinary team that includes the child abuse specialist pediatricians, caretakers in the NICU, neurosurgery, a whole bunch of folks, including their primary care doc. You'll probably be asked questions by law enforcement. They may want to know what you found. Please defer any definitive interpretations of things to one of the peds or retina attendings. So that, you know, if we're giving information out, we're giving information out consistently that they can depend on realize we are, even though the policemen at times seem kind of grumpy and demanding, we are part of the same team, we work together, um, and um, I want to continue to look at, and the family's part of the program as well. I try to avoid extensive uh, conversations with Aunt Sue, Uncle Harry, and Grandma and Grandpa. I usually excuse everybody but Mom and Dad when I look at the kids, because I don't see it as my role to have an extended conversation with the family if I can avoid it. Um, and then follow-up care. When we're seeing these kids, one of the things we want to do, realize they've had this big insult in their lives. Hemorrhages, by and large, are going to clear. You may be left with retinal damage, but the biggest determinant cause of long-term visual issues are the brain-related issues in the visual system. Central vision loss, damage to vision pathways in the brain, damage to occipital cortex. Those things can really limit things down the road. So it becomes our job after the fact, when the dust settles, neurosurgical injuries have been taken care of, to sort out how well they're seeing and what we can do to make their lives better. Have they acquired various eye problems that need attention? Do they need vision support services? Things of that sort. And so uh, ongoing, I usually see, try to see kids about six weeks or so after uh, um, you know, they're discharged from the hospital. Uh, now, typical features, retinal hemorrhages, multiple layers. Uh, if you've got multiple layers involved, meaning superficial, deep, through the retina, even subretinal hemorrhages, and you've got hemorrhages that extend from optic nerve all the way out to the periphery, that is a different story than a few hemorrhages that are superficial around the optic nerve. So just saying they're positive or they're negative isn't as helpful as being good describers of what's going on. Every patient with increased intracranial pressure at some point often has small superficial hemorrhages around the optic nerve. So if the kid's got increased intracranial pressure because their shunt isn't working, that isn't a sign of child abuse necessarily. That's just part of what's going on. Whereas when we see you know, a child who's got hemorrhages throughout the retina, multiple layers, and they have these additional findings of circumacular folds. I'll show you pictures. Um, unless they've been really horrifically injured in terms of accidental head trauma, that's very likely child abuse. And so that's where we can make a pretty emphatic statement. Have there been kids with findings just like what we think is abusive head trauma due to accidental injury? Yes, but those kids have fallen off at least two stories on a concrete been an unrestrained missile in a head-on 60 mile an hour car crash, or one child who continually gets reported and shows up in court with defense attorneys is the kid who climbed up on the television, one of those big TVs in a rack, 
and pulled the whole thing over on his head, crushed his head, and as part of his autopsy, they found changes that look just like what we see. So yes, if you have horrific head trauma, you can have changes that look just like child abuse. So it, it isn't, you know, a black and white issue. You have to interpret it in the face of what we're seeing. This issue of perimacular folds and retinoschisis come in, and current thinking is that there are more firm attachments between vitreous gel and retina over the posterior pole around retinal blood vessels, and that when you have acceleration, deceleration movements of the head, you wind up with tugging on the retina that can cause the retinoschisis, that can cause the circumacular fold that we see to develop. Those are a sign that there have been acceleration, deceleration movements, and uh, something to think about. It turns out that Brittany Coates, who is a PhD mechanical engineer uh, in the engineering department um, and is doing some research here at Moran, is incredibly interested in unraveling the biomechanical processes involved. And so she is doing basic research trying to sort this stuff out right here at the University of Utah. If you meet her, talk to her, she's really cool. Now, this is a patient who has multiple layered hemorrhages. This is taken with the RETCAM. And fovea should be about here. Optic nerve doesn't look particularly swollen. Um, there is some edema in the retina here, uh, but this would be highly suggestive and, uh, you know, of, of abuse of head trauma. The other eye, and again, this is over the posterior pole in the left eye, same patient. And realize, you know, the more superficial flame hemorrhages, deeper dot blot hemorrhages, you'll see big dark subretinal hemorrhages. They're all useful. Another patient. Now this is the circumacular fold that we're talking about here, where there's a ridge. Nick Mamelis has good path, you know, descriptions of this. I guess somebody wanted us to know it was 745. How oh, nice. Thank you. And uh, this, again, you can see to locate yourself here. This is the optic nerve. Fovea should be here. So this kind of outlines this posterior pole area. New addition in the last six, eight years with this are OCT findings. And it turns out that if you do OCT, you can see in OCT images traction on this area, bolstering my contention for years that this is due to vitreous where it's more firmly attached. And you can see those changes in the vitreous on OCT. Um, it's nice when things kind of support what you think rather than tell you that you're full of baloney. Close up view, the same kind of thing. So after the fact, again, central, and I use the term central, not cortical visual impairment, because when you use the term cortical visual impairment, it implies there's something wrong with the occipital cortex, where in fact, in a lot of these kids, it's more in the optic tract, optic radiations that we see changes, not necessarily in occipital cortex all, and, and certainly it isn't specific for that. And you can't separate the two based on a clinical examination, so I prefer that term. That's just me. You can call it what you want. Um, optic atrophy, again, you'll start to see that usually after an optic nerve insult two to three months later. And, um, it usually indicates that you've had some sort of increased intracranial pressure or some axonal injury. And then the other thing that will happen is subretinal neovascular membrane formation. I've got a, a kid that I met in the PICU at primary probably now close to 30 years ago. It was in the old children's hospital. And he had wall-to-wall -wall hemorrhages. They told me he was going to die. He survived. And uh, I followed him up until he graduated from high school and went off and did a mission for his church and got married and uh, he's a you know hard working guy now and, and doing reasonably well in life but he's got best corrected vision of about 2200 because he was left with large subretinal neovascular membranes that developed long long before we used intravitreal injections of VEGF inhibitors um, and there was really nothing that Mike Teske could do at the time, who I leaned on to try to do something, that wouldn't have destroyed his central vision with a laser. So that uh, these things have been stable for years, but 
the subretinal neovascular membranes are a real issue and can cause long-term vision loss in these kids. Um, are they pathognomonic? Again, I touched on this before. You have to interpret the findings. You know, but what I do is I word it in a way that says it's most consistent with or highly suggestive of. On the other hand, we have to be honest with our findings. And if I think it could be related to, I say that as well. Because maintaining equipoise in these areas are one thing that, you know, that the defense attorneys really harp on. And there's one in particular in town here who I've jousted with in the, in the courtroom many times, who is a physician attorney ER doc who thinks he's the world's expert in retinal hemorrhages. And he's sat in the courtroom and basically, you know, tells the jury that I'm a company stooge, that everybody is, you know, every kid with retinal hemorrhages uh, by uh, just my saying so has, you know, been abused. And that's all I ever say, and there you are. I mean, it's not true. Um, it was the case 30 years ago that we thought most infants with retinal hemorrhages, without other explanation, had probably been abused. But we've learned a lot about it in the uh, intervening years. And when there's a disparity between the extent of the injuries and the mechanism, you know, a red flag should go up. Now, differential diagnosis, birth-associated retinal hemorrhages, you never see them after six weeks of age. Accidental head trauma, I mentioned, that's rare. Um, and then all of these things have been uh, um, looked at in this glutaric acid area um, is a biggie, and every defense attorney who deals with these cases knows about this stuff and, and has this stuff, and they've read all the stuff I've written about it, and they bring the book to the darn courtroom and show me pictures from it, and I've signed a couple of them. It's kind of cool. But, you know, it's a, because what they're doing is they're trying to schmooze you to sway your testimony. They're, you know, they're doing their, I've come to terms with the idea that they're just doing their job. Their job is to get the best result they can for their client, not necessarily to see that justice is served. And that's a huge difference, and it took me a long time to catch on to that. Um, now, the other thing that I want you to be aware of is there are these um, perioptic nerve sheath hemorrhages that are only seen at autopsy. When they call us, you get a call from somebody in the PICU and they say, well, so and Joe jo just passed away. This kid was suspected of abusive head trauma. What do we need to do? Well, one of the things we want to suggest is, A, yeah, they need to go to the medical examiner's office, but please have them put a note on there that we want the eyes sent to Nick Mamelis' lab. Nick, when works, sees these, these eyes for the ME's office and does his own kind of eye autopsy, and is able to see retinal hemorrhages, folds, and some other changes that aren't seen clinically, that are difficult to find with ultrasound or uh, other imaging modalities. And that would include these um, intrascleral hemorrhages, optic nerve sheath hemorrhages, uh, that Dr. Harry, I've not been able to get him to be able to see them uh, with his ultrasound. About half of the patients you see are gonna have findings in just one eye and we don't know exactly why that is, but it doesn't make it an exclusionary thing where you say, well, just one eye is involved, it can't be uh, shaking. And is CPR the cause? No. Uh, no studies support that. And blunt trauma, usually you've got other findings of blunt trauma. You've got various bruises, lacerations, things of that sort. I have seen one patient where a parent took a child, took their thumbs, and held onto the kid's head and shook everything else. And this kid had, at autopsy, ruptures of the lens capsule in both eyes and breaks deep in the cornea, decimase layer. So trying to sort that out, we couldn't figure out what had happened until somebody fessed up. And it was their thumbs on this kid's eyes when they were holding the kid still that were the, the, the bad actor there. And then this is that um, uh, book that I mentioned. So, how many of you seen kids now with uh, suspected abuse of head trauma? And what have you seen? Um, I've seen uh, ones that look just like the picture that's like exquisitely positive where you have yep. retinal hemorrhages and all yep. the layers all the way up. And, um, and then I've seen ones that like were just negative, like the whole entire exam and the posterior fold. Like, 
just no hemorrhage whatsoever. The nerve looks normal. Not Everything good. looks fine. Yeah. And you say, and, and so you report that. Yeah. And that's, you know, the, both of those things are darn useful things, you know, from the standpoint of the child abuse. I mean, our, you know, our child abuse pediatrics colleagues have a really tough practice life. I mean, they see all these sexually abused kids and, and, and not just, you know, shaken baby syndrome. And they, they deal with all of these, and they deal with the families. You know, and they try to get the families sorted out and get people going in the right direction, get them counseling, get them jail if that's what they need. Um, but, you know, they're, they're, they're very open-minded, maintain a lot of equipoise in terms of sorting things out. I have a lot of respect for them. They do a great job. Um, what did you see, Marshall? Um, I saw one where it's pretty unilateral, where one eye was like, few shrinal hemorrhages and all quadrants. The other one had like one outright okay. by the disc. And then I saw one where the the radiologist described like the fracture, like it was a skull fracture. It was like the worst he'd seen. And it came and the baby was um, already like, completely unresponsive, like pupils were like, blood, like fixed. And inside was um, like, on one side there was like clear DM folds, or um, excuse me, macular folds. Um, or circumacular folds right. with um, retinal hemorrhages and vitreous hemorrhages everywhere, like obscuring the optic disc. On the other side, there's like a big retinal detachment with vitreous hemorrhage, and then what Dr. Dries thought looked like just a scleral tunnel where the optic nerve should have been. So it's like really, wow. really bad, yeah. That's, 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 that's awful. You know, and, and, and that, you know, keep, thing, keep in mind too, some of these stories, I mean, they really get your attention. You know, but you, I still remember the very first kid I ever saw with this as a resident. It was it was awful, you know. And the, and the kid was seen just prior to being a multiple organ donor. It was bad. I mean, it would have been easier, I think, if my son hadn't been the same age. That was hard. I remember one of your mentors, Leah Owen, the very first you know child who was a victim of abusive head trauma that she saw. Hard, so you know, if you're having troubles with any of these, you should see them. It's okay to talk about that, you know. And if you, by any means, if you find you're not getting somebody to see a kid, you can't find somebody to see them. I mean, call me because my cell phone, if it's with me, it's on. And uh, you know, if I'm in a position to respond and I'm in the U.S., I'm, I'm happy to, to come see the kid with you. Um, you know, and I'm not on, I don't take call anymore, uh, it happens when you get old. They let you not take call. It's a good thing, not taking call, that is. I don't know about getting old. It's better than the alternative. And, uh, I, I, but I, I think that, you know, in terms of these kids, it is okay to call, and I am around, and I'm happy to, to see them with you, um, you know, and to staff those things, because you need to be a good advocate for that patient and make sure somebody sees them. Questions about stuff we've talked about? I think some of the residents have mentioned this, but if we get called to see a patient um, who's in the OR either for ENT or neurosurgery procedure and that service wants us to do a retinal exam, right? do we need to do that with an attending? You have to do it with an attending. You cannot go into the OR except in an overt emergency. Okay. Some, you know, where there would be an exception and where I would go to bat for you, you'll occasionally get a call from the OR saying, drop whatever you're doing, come to OR1 at primary right now. I mean, usually those are directed at faculty, and it's always been the same circumstance. You have an ENT surgeon who has been irrigating a sinus, and suddenly the eye is out to here. You look in the back of the eye, there's no retinal perfusion, and you do what? What's that? Lateral canthotomy and? Canthalysis. Yeah, upper and lower cruise canthalysis. If you do not know how to do that, you grab somebody more senior, they'll show you how to do it. The idea is that when you have acute accumulation of either blood, irrigating fluid, air in the orbit, it can cause the intraorbital pressure to be greater than the systolic blood pressure perfusing the retina. So you have, the, at that point, a central retinal artery occlusion, and you need to acutely decompress the orbit. So every ophthalmologist should know how to do this. You basically just take a straight hemostat, put one blade inside, one outside the lateral canthus, go back to your tips, just touch the 
the lateral orbital rim, clamp, take straight scissors, usually blunt tip like Steven's scissors, cut, and then you reach inside above and below and you feel this thing that feels kind of like a guitar string with the tips of your scissors. You put the scissors around it and you cut it. And that's what that involves. What you're doing is you're allowing the lids to move forward to dissipate the force and hopefully fluid will be reabsorbed. If it's an ongoing arterial hemorrhage, you're kind of toast. Um, it's not a good thing and I have seen that. Uh, but most of the time here, you go to the OR to do that, you wind up with a situation where things dramatically improve. Um, there's a paper in ophthalmology from about 1983. Um, it was written by myself and one of my fellow residents at Michigan, John Fleischman, about doing just that with acute orbital emphysema. You know, I, I saw a patient in the ER, University of Michigan, who had dramatic, uh, uh, I, it was a prisoner. He was in there because he'd fallen and hit his face, and yeah, he had a floor fracture, but he had 20-20 vision, normal motility, and I said, fine, we just need to see him and follow him. He looks great, and I'm getting in my car in the parking lot, and the surgery resident from the ER starts banging on the side of my car, saying, you gotta come back and see this guy right now. Something awful just happened. Well, what he did is he vomited, and he pushed a whole bunch of air into his orbit, and so he went to no light perception from 2015 vision, and he had a rock hard orbit. And with a Shiatz tonometer, his scale reading is zero with a 15 gram weight, which is equivalent to about an interocular pressure of 90. Um, it was huge. And so I just kind of looked at him, and I'd been up for hours and hours, like two days, I think, straight. So I just said, give me a, a suture removal kit. I looked at the guy and said, this is going to hurt you more than it's going to hurt me. And it went, cut, cut, cut. And five minutes later, his vision was 20-20. You know, it's a very gratifying procedure. And it's one of those things like, you know, every general surgeon should know how to get into a chest, cross clamp the aorta, you know, momentarily, or they shouldn't be doing general surgery. I think every ophthalmologist should know how to do a lateral canthotomy and upper lower cruise cantholysis because you can save vision with that procedure. Um, and so um, I didn't make the procedure up. We didn't write, we just wrote it because people had talked about it, you know, with hemorrhage and various things. But, you know, at the time, the thinking was orbital emphysema was just something to kind of say, oh, yeah, that's air in the orbit. So what? And, uh, you know, so that was the first time somebody had reported. You know, patients, in, in, my buddy John had had a, a similar patient with air in the orbit. And, uh, um, but as far as the OR goes, the idea, the OR's responsibility is to, to kind of make sure that things are going okay. And let's say you go in and you do something, you think you need to do something and something happens. You're kind of holding the bag and the OR's holding the bag, so that's where they hold the line. If you need something, we'll find somebody. And, and you know, and it may be, if, you know, often you'll find if it's, you know, daytime hours, one of us is there, you know, I can poke my head in and be the attending of record. Then you can do whatever you need to do, and it's all good. And I'm also then there to be, uh, you know, a backup to look with you if there's an issue. Uh, but yes, unfortunately, you do need someone in the OR. You can go into the MRI scanner, and if you've got somebody there who's sedating things in a while, that brings up one other issue. Let's say, You've sedated kids in the past, you've you know, spent a lot of time on an ICU rotation or something, you're comfortable with that. Can you just say, I want to give this kid, you know, some propofol and, and I'm gonna take responsibility for it and I'm gonna take a look at the eyes? And the answer is no. Categorically, absolutely. There are specific sedation privileges. And uh, for the longest time, I was the only one of our faculty who had sedation privileges in primary, and I gave them up because it just wasn't doing it often enough. And it's just oh so much more convenient to have somebody who's doing it regularly do it, so they're staying on top of things. But I mean, you need to have pals, and you need, you just watch a video and answer a bunch of questions. But I think if you're gonna sedate kids, there are people, say it clock. <laughs> They're telling me it's time to go. So, um, so I think that that and that's a great question that comes up. But if you think, I mean, again, call. You know, I'm in clinic. 
I can run down, I can be the staff of record in between patients and, and help you do things, but you, yes, you need to find a faculty of record. It doesn't mean that they need to come and sit there the whole time. Okay. You know, I'll come help you do a timeout, run out the door and let you look at the kid or if there's something you want me to see, look at it with you. Um, and we'll get patients taken care of. That way, if somebody doesn't like something, they can blame me and they're not gonna try to hang you. Um, because one of my roles at primary is to sort of be the source of most blame uh, if things aren't going well, um, because I'm in a better position to grumble back at somebody. Or, you know, we also wanna make sure we're taking the absolute best care of patients. Other questions about any of this as far as just the logistics or this abusive head trauma Again, look at the stuff in the home study course. If you haven't, I know Brad passed that information out. Try to, you know, get smart about it and be aware of it. And, uh, um, you know, it's been one of my interests. I mean, I think when I was a resident, I got interested in post-anesthetic retinal hemorrhages and looked at a lot of the military. There's a whole bunch of, you can believe what they used to do to soldiers. They still do, I guess. But they would take these guys in these machines that would simulate massive G-forces while they're trying to decide how far they could push people and have them survive, you know, in airplanes and spacecraft. And guess what? They accumulated a wealth of data about retinal hemorrhages and G-forces. <laughs> so while we can't really take, usually, lab animals, maybe children, never, and shake one a little more than the other and see who gets retinal hemorrhages, um, they certainly have done things like that with soldiers, um, where you, you fling this one forward a little faster, harder than the last one, and you see what happened to them. And yes, your tax dollars have paid for that. Um, so anyway, thanks for coming this morning.